any questions. I'll start in about five minutes. So if you have any questions first, please ask your questions. So very receptive audience. Very good. Namaste all and uh, welcome to our flower show through the divine flower people. You can see how much work they have done. And uh, Poonam told me that she was overwhelmed and this lady comes to her and she says, my name is Padma, which means lotus, and I'm here to help you. And, and they got everything done through this lady. So wonderful. So today I'm going to share some very personal things with you, some experiences when I was a child, because this is how I made the first contact with flowers, and of course through that, the contact with Mother Earth, which is so absolutely important in this yoga, because this yoga is not a running away from the Earth but embracing the earth, purifying what we have spoiled, and that purification will come, I assure you. It will, become, it will come because the supermental force that is now descending on the earth has the power to transform plastics, filth, the, despo the spoiling of our lakes and rivers and oceans, everything will change. It will change because there is only change in this world. We can never remain satisfied with our life. There is always something within us that is nudging us, that is pushing us higher and higher. So I'll begin my talk now and tell you when I was about five years old the story of the hyacinths. Hyacinths are named by mother pride of beauty and indeed they are very proud of their beauty and extremely fragrant. Well, my mother planted a bed of hyacinths and they were in full bloom. And I think I was just five years old. And I saw them and I fell in love with them and I tore every one of them up and brought them to my mother. And she wept for the destruction of her garden and the gift from her son. But even more than that, it began my deep contact with the earth. You see, Sri Aurobindo tells us that the earth is a sacred body, a sacred being. And he says, the world is only the form it takes to manifest. Interesting. So, earth is a conscious soul. And it is aware of everything. He wrote this to Dilip Kumar Roy, who pestered him with almost 5,000 letters that he responded to. And to go back to my youth, my father was a landscaper, and I would design gardens with him I would plant with him. I would do the regular things that anyone does in this field, cutting grass, raking leaves, uh, digging out weeds, planting trees, shrubs, creepers, everything. My whole life became one of a song of the earth. And if you read Leaves of Grass of Walt Whitman, you will understand some of that. Uh, Sri Aurobindo has very high praise for Walt Whitman. He mentions him at least four or five times in the future poetry. The child asks him, what is grass? 
It's a good question for all of us. What is grass? You see, without grass and without weeds, we would be living in a desert and barely living because our nutrients are all from that process of the earth uniting with the plant life. We know that in matter that was for millenniums static, life descended. And from life, mind came in. And now we have to go above mind, far above mind, to the next level. The next level is higher mind, illumined mind, intuitive mind, and over mind. Then there's a third level, and that is the super mind, and above that, Satchit Ananda. We have a long way to go, but the way is given to us by the mother through divine love. The only divine love has the power to eradicate the falsehoods of the world. Now, we put together a book of flower significances named my mother. She named approximately 900 flowers. It's an extraordinary work for anyone. And mother did it just like that. I sent flowers to mother in the mid to late 1970s, well, in the mid 19s, early to mid 1970s. I would send every week a flower. And I had the opportunity to go to Bangalore and meet the director of the Lalbag Gardens. And I brought him a huge amount of plants from America that uh, friends in America would collect with me every Sunday these seeds, and I brought so many of them. Well, he was extremely grateful. And he returned the gift with 12 flowers that mother named for Oroville. Charm of Oroville, realization of Oroville, firmness of Oroville, beauty of Oroville, I could go on and on. And one day mother said to Tara, and she was my intermediary in sending the flowers to mother, mother said to her, we need a somewhat larger name for the world. And she named those Oroville flowers the new creation. So we have the charm of the new creation, the beauty of the new creation. And uh, people don't realize very much that there are these 12 flowers that carry two names, Oroville's name and the name of the new creation. Now there's one other flower that mother gave two names. Does anyone have an idea what that flower might be? It's a native flower to this area, very beautiful. I'll give you a hint, lovely blue flowers along the branches. Huh? Miracle. Miracle. Miracle, yes. There's a second name for miracle. Heir of Oroville. So the heir of Oroville is a miracle. And we cannot breathe anything in Oroville without breathing that miracle. Right now we are breathing it. How does mother give the name to a flower? And how can we do it eventually when we have evolved a little higher? Mother would catch the vibration of the flower and then she would say, by an approximation, I could put it into French or English. And that's how the flowers have been named. Now, we think that there are only 900, 
but there are 90,000, 900,000 flowers that also have names that are calling to us to give them a name. And I have a friend, his name is Angelo, who has named four different flowers. They came to him just like that. And they can come to us also. Uh, people say, no, 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 only mother can name a flower. Mother's working through us. Why can't we name flowers? If we truly and sincerely feel that vibration and can bring it into a language, whatever language, doesn't matter, we have many common names, but common names are misleading because common names can be applied to dozens of different flowers. And only the botanical name, the genus and the species, or the variety, the clone, whatever you want to call it, the hybrid, is correct. So when we have, a gentleman from Taiwan was talking to me just this morning, and he said, there is this flower that is so extraordinary. It, it doesn't need much water. It blooms in the intense heat, and it has yellow flowers hanging down like that. And I said, it's imagination. Of course it's imagination. And I can remember in the early 70s when we planted an imagination tree by our pond where we would draw water out every day. Well, the fragrance of it in May when everything was intensely hot, it just covered you. Huh? And, and you, you took another breath a breath of beauty, a breath of delight. And that is what the flowers should give us. After all, Sri Aurobindo says this world was created for Ananda, not for any other purpose, just for that true Ananda. If we can touch that in a flower, we can touch it in a human being. Yes, it's a little more difficult, but we can do it. And we must do it, because we must bring a harmony into this world of chaos and this world of falsehood and power grabbing and darkness. So I'm going to share with you some things. Um, I'd like to go back to my, my youth for a few moments and tell you what my father used to ask me to do. He would say, go into this forest and dark, dark forest. And you will see rotting stumps, which become actually like peat moss. And on those stumps, there will be small hemlock plants. You can dig them out with your hand and bring them, and I will grow them into beautiful plants. It was one of the great experiences of my life. That and lying in his flatbed truck with just pants, no shirt, and looking up into the sky and seeing that beauty surrounding me. I've never forgotten it. I live it every day. It is a beauty that I see in the souls who are gathered here. It's a beauty that I see and feel when I touch the earth. It's everywhere. This beauty is everywhere. It's, it's a divine beauty. So I'm going to read you a couple of questions from, from us to Mother. Because we, who were with her for so many years, wanted to know more about plants. And there was a gardener whose name was Parichand, and there's a long, long correspondence with Mother and Parichand on how to grow plants. I don't know, has, has anyone here read that correspondence? Well, it's very special. Mother writes, flowers are very receptive and they are happy 
when they are loved. Now, we asked mother, why do plants fall ill? And what can we do to help them? A very important question. What mother writes is rather strong. When man does not meddle, that means fool around, the illness of plants seems to be accidental. But man's action has upset the life of plants, even as that of animals, of course. You know that young calves, young cows die every year eating poisoned plants. They are with people. A cow will never eat a poison plant on the road. Never. It takes a faith in people, a trust in people, and if they fed it a poisonous plant, it would eat it. It would never do that without human beings. Mother writes, men have upset the life of plants and animals, and supermen have upset the life of men. Wow. Already it's happening. My friend, a dear, dear friend, who is probably the most brilliant man I know, has said something about children, and I want you all to hear about this. He says that these vestigial remnants, we call them vestigial remnants, like the appendix, which we no longer need, have disappeared from the body. He said, now wisdom teeth are gone. When I was young, they would get infected and they would be pulled out of us because they had to make room for the real teeth. They don't come anymore. They're not in children anymore. Children, when they are born, have hair. Children, when they are born, their eyes are open. And they have the sense of touch already. Not just the mother's breasts, but they have the sense of touch all over. It's, it's extraordinary how fast the evolution is proceeding. Now, we says, I give you an example. There are many plants we are trying to grow here which suffer because of our climate. How can we help them to grow and blossom here? Mother says, naturally, plants which like cold climates would grow in greenhouses. Also by planting forests, one could have a regulating action on the climate. My gosh. The green belt. You go from here to Pondy, it's probably almost three degrees cooler in Oroville than Pondy already. Now, here's a story about my friend Parichand. Each year he would get 50 of these new hybrid roses and he would grow them. Bloom, send them to mother, roses would die. He'd get another 50 the next year. They would bloom, he would send the flowers to mother, all the plants would die. So he wrote to mother, what can I do to make these plants survive? And mother wrote, you must get it into the consciousness of the plant that he can make it in this climate. So when I began the Matramandia nursery, and I brought many, many new plants, I would say to that plant, if I can make it here, you can make it. And they would make it. <clears throat> Mother says, growth of consciousness in the atmosphere will surely have an effect which is difficult to describe beforehand. And it's that growth of consciousness that is changing when I asked mother about the plants, she said, oh, they will be among the first to change. 
because their life is an aspiration for light. Oh. If we had the same aspiration for light every day, every moment of the day, we too would blossom into greater and more beautiful beings. And we are on that path now. And we're all on the same path. No religions have this path. Even, even the uh, Shankarites, the Buddhists, yes, they can attain moksha. They can get deliverance. But they leave this precious earth behind. And our work is to make this earth a life divine. I see every year dozens of new flowers. How are they created? Well, there are people who love a plant and they live 20, 30 years with that one plant. I'll give you an example. We have the flower called Portulaca, Sri Aurobindo's Compassion. One man who lived with him, an amateur gardener, no less, not a professional. He lived with these flowers and he discovered the DNA. And now you can get Sri Aurobindo's compassion in any single color you would like. You want pink, you want yellow, you want red, white, single, double. Even in Japan now, they're two and a half inches across one flower. So we see how evolution is taking such rapid steps in the world of plants. Now, Mother, of course, says that the Superman is going to be to man what man is to the animal. What a leap this is, what a leap. We should be so grateful that we are here at this time on this sacred earth to participate in this journey. Mother says, plants have feelings. They are alive. They should not be treated brutally. And she says, look, it's enthusiasm, petunia. See how beautiful it is? It must be put in water right away. Otherwise, it needs vital force, and water is vital force. It is lovely. What fantasy. Now, I asked Mother a number of questions because we were having a lot of problems at the Machamandia nursery. Not to mention the cows and the goats that were being sent in, sent in by the boys, but the insects themselves. We could work for a month growing things and in one day they would be wiped out by insects. So I wrote to Mother and um, Let's see if I can find her response, because um, well, there are so many letters from, from us to Mother, but I'll tell you what Mother said. I said, is there a malignant or ill will in the insect world that they would attack these flowers so violently. Mother said, no, it is not like that. They do good, they do bad. Obviously, flies and bees and others pollinate our plants, our fruits, our vegetables. And she taught me in that one sentence that our work is never to eradicate anything from this earth but to find balance. And that's what I do. I try to find balance with these plants and flowers. The insects can have their share, just as the birds have their share of cherries and other fruits. 
and the squirrels have their share, and we have a share. So, we were doing the service tree in the ashram, and the roots had come up above the earth, and people couldn't sit there anymore. There was a time when behind the samadhi, 100 or more people could sit. And so I said, all right, I'll take up the work. And we dug out huge areas of soil, and we were able to gently put the roots back in and cover them over, always using something like a rubber tire tube or something, something that would not injure the root. So in preparing the beds, flower beds, this disciple asked, it may be found necessary to cut away some roots of the trees. Mother says, this is not possible. No roots of trees must be cut. Apart from that, if the trees are respected, you can prepare these beds. Wow. Then the disciple writes to her, yesterday I took out a considerable quantity of soil to see if any worm was at its root. If you like, I will now take out the whole lump of roots and inspect it. Now this is an interesting answer from mother. There would be no use in doing that. Besides, plants must not be disturbed too much. Like people, they need quiet to get strength and grow. I tell you, in this book alone, you can do an entire sadhana. Just going through all the flowers. Look what Mother has done. She has given us flowers that represent matter, which is a dark, dull red. And then flowers that represent the physical, that vibrate with the physical. That's a brighter red. Then the vital, the lavenders, the purples. Then the heart, pink the psychic, then the mind, mental. And when you get above the mind, you get into the blues, and then finally you get into the gold and orange flowers. She's given us this whole series of evolution from dull matter to the supermind. Uh, here's my, my question to mother. Are there forces directly hostile to vegetal nature? Are insects a manifestation of these forces? Mother writes quite a long answer to me. There, there do not seem to exist forces consciously and voluntarily hostile to the vegetal kingdom. Insects do harm because they feed on plants. But in this way, they serve them also. Both things are there, good and bad, without any conscious will. They do good, they do harm, without knowing it. Wow. It gives you a new perspective about this whole world of insects, this world of plants, this symbiosis of different plants. You, you take this mealy bug, which is a problematic fellow, and you can see him sort of white on the back leaves of plants. Well, he can multiply very quickly, but actually he doesn't move. So there's an ant that comes, and the mealybug secretes a honey. The ant feeds on that honey and carries him and the young ones all over the plants. So interesting. These symbiotic relationships have always interested me greatly. They, they are throughout nature. I, I want to share with you something that I've heard my friend Ranganathan say so many times. We have a seed of, of a tree, and we know that tree is going to come from that seed. How do we know it? It's not there in the seed. We only know it because if we plant the seed and water it and care for it, eventually the tree is going to come. 
And Sri Aurobindo in Savitri tells us so many things. He says, and in the worm foresees the coming God. Whoa. In the worm. Everything is evolving. Even the worm is evolving. It may become a greater worm in its next life. It may become an amphibian. We don't know. So I share with you some quotes from Savitri because they are so relevant. A few shall see what none yet understands. God shall grow up while the wise men talk and sleep. For man shall not know the coming till its hour, and belief shall be not till the work is done. So much is in those four lines that only a few can see now what no one else understands. Now, what is this God shall grow up while the wise men talk and sleep? Well, interesting experience my wife, Mary Helen, had. She's in a deep dream state, and it becomes more than a dream, but a dream experience. And she sees Sri Aurobindo, who's two feet tall. And she writes to Madhav Pandit, and she said, how can this be? And Madhav says, he is growing through the earth into his larger and larger body. Incredible. So it's happening right now, today, at this moment. We are sons of God and must be even as he. His human portion, we must grow divine. Our life is a paradox with God for key. The world is other than we now think and see. Our lives a deeper mystery than we have dreamed. Our minds are starters in the race to God. Our souls, deputed selves of the Supreme. And this is something we should all repeat to ourselves every day. The divine is within me. All that I believe I can do, I can do because it is he who is doing it, and not I. One or two more, and we get back to plants. Only were safe who kept God in their hearts. Courage, their armor. Faith, their sword. They must walk. The hand ready to smite, the eye to scout. Casting a javelin regard in front, heroes and soldiers in the army of light. We see here that uh, sometimes we must fight for the truth and for the light. When the ashram was attacked, one of the inmates gave his body to defend the ashram walls. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, you must kill all those you love. How can we understand that with this mind? Impossible. We have to go to the higher mind. When everything becomes different, our view of life becomes different. Our understanding of each other becomes different. There comes a contact with soul to soul that is so perfect and so pure. Now, if we don't yet have that contact, at least we can try to feel it. If we can't feel it, we can have the faith that it is there, that we are truly all one soul, one body, in different forms. Men, women, children, old, young. Okay, back to plants. 
Mother, does a plant have its own individuality? And does it also reincarnate after death? Interesting question. Mother writes, this may happen, but it is accidental. There are trees, trees especially, which have lived long and can be the home of a conscious being, a vital being. Generally, it is vital entities which take shelter in trees, or else certain beings of the vital plane which live in forests, as certain beings of the vital live in water. There were old legends like that, but they were based on facts. The plants serve as home and shelter, but the being is not created by the plant itself. And all of you who love the earth know that when you lean against a tree, that force can come into you. Obviously, it's very clear on the banyan tree and the service tree. But there are poets who have shown us such beauty in their poems. And I'm always looking for the new poetry, the higher poetry, the poetry descending from an overhead plane. So um, I'll open up to questions and answers, or we can go and speak about different flowers, if you like, whatever you would like. Or I can continue with my story. Any questions? When I would go to mother, and once I went with Sham Sundar, who was at that time sort of the secretary of Oroville to mother. And I showed mother the plant that they use in the I Ching. They toss the sticks of the I Ching. And mother was very, very interested. But she didn't give it her name immediately. And then Sham Sundar said to me, Put your head in mother's lap. I had never done that in all my life. I had always put my head on her feet. And whether it was for moments or minutes, it was always on her feet. And I put my head in her lap. I can't, ex I can't speak about it anymore. OK. We asked Mother for a name for this book. She named it Flowers and Their Messages. She did not name it the spiritual significance of flowers, which is OK. That double book calls it that. But Mother wanted us to understand the message that the flowers give us. So let's take some common plants that all of you know, the hibiscus. Do you know that mother has named 43 different hibiscus? 43. Generally, the hibiscus represents power. Obviously, it's offered to Mahakali. But there are many kinds of power. And the garden of power, mother has named a hibiscus that is aesthetic power, very important. I've talked with Gilles Guigan about this. Aesthetic power is so different from ordinary power. And so we planted, oh, I think maybe almost five plants of aesthetic power in that garden now. There are other powers, power in service of the future, power of the psychic consciousness, power of integral purity, power of perseverance, power of progress, power of spiritual beauty. Mother loved this flower very much. She did name some 20 roses also. So I would say those two are the most common that mother named. Now, what I would get seeds from America, and 
and I would make compost according to an ancient uh, design by Sir Albert Howard, in which we would do layers like a layer cake of water, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And the compost would come out so beautiful. Now there's a man at the Botanic Garden, his name is Frank. He's going to come to us soon with new method of composting that we can learn from him. We always have to learn. We have to continue learning. So I would send mother these zinnias. The zinnia is endurance. I have traveled America up and down, back and forth many, many times. I've seen in the desert zinnias in bloom without water for three months, perfectly happy. That's endurance. I have seen so many things that we really can't quite understand how the plant can do it. The banyan tree is a plant that's native to this area. And when we first came, there was a lady caring for this tree. It was a small tree. And the village boys would bring the goats and feed them the aerial roots. And this lady would stop them. Now the tree, because they have planted grass underneath it, I'm not criticizing anyone, I'm making a statement. It has gotten to four times its original size. And it will get bigger and bigger. And we will have to prune it. I don't like to have to prune the banyan. But there's almost no room for the garden of life or power anymore. They are small gardens, not the huge gardens that will be out later on. Youth, harmony, perfection. All of these are vast gardens. So we have to keep things in check, as we have to keep ourselves in check. And so each year I prune the banyan a little bit, never taking anything like one third of it off. Although Jean Jean says you have to take down the ficus religiosa, which is the people tree, that many people have experiences under, the old banyan tree, which is on the eastern side, and then you've got to cut the banyan, which is the geographical center of Oroville, back to its original size. It's impossible, impossible. When there was another group in charge of the Matrimandir, they would send the workers out when they had no work, and they would say, bring down aerial roots. And when I saw the tree after returning after many years, it was like a prison. And so I decided I will cut as many extraneous roots as possible. And there were people lined up against me chanting, things to kill me and to harm me. And then there was the secretary and Roger who, and Jean who were all supporting me. And I had this wonderful fellow from Spain who was a, a tree surgeon. And we began to cut it together. We cut so many aerial roots. And at the very end, I counted how many roots were left. And there were 28, Oroville's birthday. And there are still 28. OK. So we did zinnias. Now there are plants that are often named in honor of a scientist who named them or worked in certain areas. One of them was. Um, well, two of them, Brandis and Fairchild, went from the Himalayas down to the tip of India, naming thousands and thousands of plants. Well, there's one plant that was named for a Swedish botanist, Thunberg. And we have the Thunbergia named after him. 
Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Thunbergias. One of them is named for Sri Aurobindo, opening to Sri Aurobindo's force. It's under the banyan now. There are two little plants by a stone, by a boulder, opening to Sri Aurobindo's force. Now there's another one that's a, a small creeper, and mother named it Obscurity, offering itself to be transformed. And <laughs> I was with my friend Rosine for a week, and we would walk up and down the streets of the, uh, the township that borders Los Angeles. And I found a pure Thunbergia palata with no purple spot in the center. And I sent it to mother, and she wrote, transformation makes the obscurity disappear. So, and she wrote, obscurity will disappear more and more as the transformation progresses. This is the period that we are in now, that we have to awaken to the moment that the supermental is on earth and is helping us, working with each soul here. Whether you're aware of it or not, doesn't matter. It's helping everyone. And when it is fully active, it will first come as power, not love. Interesting. Love will come after, but there has to be its power first to withstand against the falsehood. After that, love will come and ananda will come and everything will come. Mother has named many fruits. What is the name of the grape? Anyone? Huh? Ananda. Divine Ananda. What is the name of the mango? Divine knowledge. Divine knowledge. Mango, you eat the mango and you're eating divine knowledge. You're eating the grapes, and you're eating divine ananda. Imagine. And she's named other fruits also. It's, it's amazing. The lemons are chastity, and the pomelo is continence. Oh. You see what Mother has done for us, giving us these flowers. And we have her lotus in the front, Aditi, the divine consciousness the avatar, Sri Aurobindo, in a body. Well, I've talked almost an hour. I think it's pretty good. If you have any questions. Can you speak of the beauty of supermental love, the horrible flower? Yes. It's a rather sad story, but um, I had planted it where they now have the canal, and they transplanted it. Years and years ago, I planted it. It bloomed many, many flowers every day, and now it's suffering. Probably the soil mix was not good, but we are putting chelated iron on it, and I will ask for margaritas people to spray it also. We have to bring it back to great health. It's just right there as you're entering the Matrimandya to go to the chamber. And it's, it's chlorotic. We have to be more conscious about plants. Beauty of supermental love is not difficult to propagate. It should be all over Oroville. Grow flowers, love them, cherish them, speak to them. They will reply to you 
in their own language. And this is how I've come to know them, because when they speak to me, I know what to do for them. I don't have to use the mind, which always has 10 different ideas as to what to do. All I have to do is establish the silence and the calm within. Connect with the flower, even with the plant, and see what it needs. And I'm given the answer. There was a black man in Missouri. His name was George Washington Carver. He knew every plant and every insect in that whole area of the US. And for me, one of his quotes is something I live by. Anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. The man who concentrated on fruit plants, his name was Luther Burbank. He would walk down a row of 10,000 seedlings of plums and pick out the two that would be superior. Just walking down, he'd say this one, that one. That connection is what we must establish. Thank you all. Namaste. 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 I'll give you one example and then we'll go. Uh, I had a friend in Texas and every year he had this grove of pecan trees and the insects, the worms would come and eat and he would get a very small crop and he was always killing these wasps. And then one day, as often happens with us, there's some illumination, some brilliance comes into the head. And he saw that the wasps were eating all those worms. He said, I will not kill any wasps again. And he would get huge crops of pecans, growing everything organically. And I was able to write the foreword to his book on organic gardening. So there are so many ways we can garden organically. But mother was very clear when she said to me, for the flowers, you can use chemicals. But once again, you must be conscious of how you're using them. You're not out to obliterate anything, to destroy anything. But if something is out of control, and the insects have taken over, you're allowed to do something to help the plant. Only in rare instances. But mother was so vast. You see, people will say, no, 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 mother never meant that. She did say that. She could say the opposite of things to us to make us understand that everything is united. Everything is one. And everything will one day be divine. Namaste.